morning. My name is Jane Ranham, and I chair the St. David's Partnership and Child Welfare Ministry Team here at Westminster. We are pleased today to join the Social Ministry Team to present this morning's forum, which is a, a, the second one in a series relating to children's mental health. The Social Justice Forum's uh, theme this year is investing in each other's future. Through these forums, we aim to learn about opportunities for engagement and action by Westminster members to help ensure all our neighbors thrive, to better understand the structures and systems that have failed many of our neighbors, and to explore ways that can, we can work with uh, better to build better outcomes. Today, we are pleased to welcome a team from the Harmon Center right upstairs here in Westminster, which is a part of St. David's Child and um, Family Development uh, Program with their main uh, campus being out in Minnetonka. Uh, we have three uh, individuals uh, from St. David's with us today. The first is Maureen Walsh, who I want to say an extra special thank you to because she has worked so closely with our team, um, but she is head of development uh, for St. David's. The other two speakers are Melissa Williams, who is the Family Place Program Director and a clinical social worker, and Nick Lynch, who is a speech pathologist, language pathologist, and Harmon Center Pediatric Therapy therapy supervisor. This morning, through a case study of one child and his mother, they will discuss trauma, its impacts, and the multidisciplinary approach to treatment here at the Harmon Center. Before we get started, just a couple of reminders. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry, I'm too short, I think. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of items. For those attending in person in the Miser Room, please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you so that if you make a comment or ask a question, the people on live stream who are also watching this program can hear the question or comment. And for those attending on live stream, please submit your comments or questions in the live stream chat and they will then um, be responded to. So right now I want to welcome our guest, but before I, I um, introduce uh, uh, Maureen, I want to give you a little bit of background information about our two specialists. Melissa Williams is a licensed social worker who ha uh, has worked at St. David's since 2009 after completing a clinical master's internship in the center's family place program and graduating from the clinical social worker program at St. Catherine's University and at the University of St. Thomas. Initially starting as a mental health practitioner, Melissa moved into mental health professional role and is currently the Family Place Program Director at the Harmon Center. In addition to two decades of experience, Melissa brings to her work a passion for partnering with caregivers and the children to establish strong attachments during these most informative years. Nick, who happens to live downtown, so is a neighbor that way too, has a master's degree in speech language pathology from the University of Minnesota at Duluth. He started at St. David's almost 10 years ago um, as a speech language pathologist, working with outpatient clients and in the Aut Autism Day program. He is now the pediatric therapy supervisor for the um, Harmon Center. Nick was drawn to St. David's because of the organization's emphasis on relation-based and child family-led therapy 
as he has seen that the, that is the only way to make true progress is through the foundation of a supportive and collaborative relationship. We warmly welcome all three of you. Thank you for sharing your Sunday morning with us. Good morning. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, okay, I'd just like to take a few minutes and introduce St. David Center. I don't want to take very much time because the uh, real important uh, uh, presentation of the day today, I want to be sure that there's enough room for that. So um, St. David Center is 60 years old. We uh, were founded by uh, a, a person that had um, uh, that had developed the first one of the first inclusive preschool programs in the country, Sybil Lynch, and what she built into our DNA is a commitment to every child. We talk about meeting every family on their path, um, even when development is complex. And you can see that our um, vision is that every every life that we touch, um, um, you know, develops in a way where they're fully. Uh, engaged in the community um, through their involvement with us. So that's what we're aimed at. Um, we we uh, achieve that mission through th uh, three uh, core service areas and then our parent and professional um, training and consultation service as well. Um, and I just want to uh, spend a little bit more time talking about that center core service area because that's out of that work is uh, was the development of the Harmon Center. So still a, our foundational um, program that we started with in 1961 was our early childhood education program. Again, um, meeting every child where they're at, um, saying yes very early in our organization's history to children with special needs. And then uh, out of that um, program grew a number of therapies basically in the, in the early years of, uh, of uh, after our inception to really come alongside kids in their development through pediatric therapies, through parent support, um, and then staying with those families long term is what led to uh, now a, a pretty thriving uh, disability support services program as well. I want to just pause because in the last 10 years, we've been talking a lot as an organization about social inequities, uh, uh, social determinants of health and inequities in those um, key uh, areas of our life, of our community life that um, really play a huge part in how children grow and develop. And so you can see here that there's a number of things. It, this is uh, very much part of the consciousness of Westminster to be thinking about these issues and, they, and the um, way that they um, cross-sect in, in uh, people's lives and really create a, uh, can create a system where um, kids are not thriving out of, because of these inequities. We also think about the, these, these and many data points um, about what's happening for kids in, across, our, uh, across the country, um, particularly tied to the Harmon Center as we were thinking about our concept, proposing our concept to Westminster Presbyterian a number of years back. We thought about that statistic that one in four kids in America before they turn four have experienced or witnessed trauma. And so we were concerned about those kids, uh, concerned about their families and wanted uh, to dedicate a, a clinic, basically an early intervention center close by where kids could get access to services that they need and where our, our staff would come alongside families in a really uh, profound and meaningful way. Um, you could also see, you know, the, these other statistics all point to the prevalence of needs uh, across our community. So we're holding in mind the social inequities uh, um, that, that, you know, can lead to such poor developmental outcomes for kids across the community. And then we think about these data points with what's happening for kids. And then our services are the third piece in that. Um, so you can see here these, uh, these services that we can come alongside families uh, with. Um, from children's mental health, which is of the 4,300 children that we see in a, uh, serve in a year, about 2,000 of them receive a mental health service all the way um, through that, that progression. And I'll show you that through a different lens here. So we think about intensity and, se and severity of needs. And we think it, it, in our program, this is one way that we're, uh, I know that you, you um, heard from Washburn this last week, if you attended the um, social justice uh, forum this last week, Washburn is so deeply uh, invested in children's mental health as the, as the place that they um, want to um, uh, focus their services. Our services are a little bit broader than that. So Washburn is a referral, uh, refers kids to St. David's Center. Um, and, and we, in, in, our, um, in our approach, 
as Mellon um, and Nick will talk about today, we really bring a multidisciplinary approach. So mental health is a huge part of what we do. And then we bring these additional services alongside as well, based on the intensity and severity of needs that, we're, that we see in kids. So again, our goals, um, and Mel and Nick will talk about this today, really we're coming alongside families where uh, that something has happened typically in the parent-child relationship or in the case of our East African Autism Day Treatment Program, um, there's some there's trauma through the child's experience of autism. And then we, we, um, we come alongside those families from a, the standpoint of the social inequities um, in, in terms of what's laying that groundwork um, from uh, around their health and long-term outcomes, and then those really profound needs that we see, and then intersect um, our services in that to, to try and make a difference. So these are just a couple data points that I would want you to know. Um, 4,300 children in a year, um, 522 staff, so really big staff team. We uh, provide therapies and services um, that are individual, family, and group. Those services are provided at two clinic locations, including, of course, the Harmon Center here upstairs and our 60,000 square foot building out in Minnetonka, but then 30 co-located partner sites across the community, so schools and child care centers across the community, a handful of other faith communities in, in addition to um, those partner sites, and then hundreds of families' homes, that you'll, uh, and you'll hear about that a little bit today too. And then this braided funding model that really, um, with charitable revenue, uh, with gifts from uh, individuals, corporations, and foundations um, comes together to support that work. I will now turn it over to Nick to talk about the vision and services of, of um, the Harman Center. Hello, good morning. Um, so uh, Harman Center uh, opened in 2018. We're coming up on five years, which is very exciting for us. Um, and our vision is to support and strengthen parent-child relationships, improve outcomes in children who have faced trauma, and partner with families and communities to create and sustain a center that supports healing, health, and well-being. Um, kind of the layout uh, Mel and I planned is that I would kind of lay a foundation of um, topic of the topic that we're talking about and give some definition so we all kind of have a common ground um, and then mel is going to present a case study um, of a kiddo that both of us have worked with and family uh, so we hear the term child development um, but it re refers to how a child yeah oh sure okay okay is that better okay <laughs> So I'm just gonna give some definitions so we all have some common ground to work from. So child development um, refers to how your child grows and changes over time. And experts divide child's growth and development into four areas. So we think about physical development, refers to strength and motor skills. Cognitive development is our thinking and problem solving. Language development is my specialty um, and refers to communication, how we understand language or how we're able to express through language. Um, and then social emotional development and that affects how a child interacts with others and processes their feelings. Um, and so child development is really measured through developmental milestones. Um, children all develop at their own pace and there's a wide range of what we'd expect. However, most children pass through specific changes at approximately the same time as they get older. Some examples um, from the baby's first year of life may include smiling intentionally, sitting without support, waving goodbye. Um, when we think about speech and language development, which is kind of my area of expertise, at the child's first year, we're looking for them to start um, producing their first word. And then as they get to two years old, we want to start seeing a vocabulary of between 50 to 80 words. And then they're starting to combine those words um, into smaller sentences. And how children progress through this development is through an attachment, a healthy attachment with um, either a parent or a caregiver 
Um, and that just brings back to our mission of true growth and progress happens through the foundation and the root of a supportive relationship. So if we kind of look at what a healthy attachment cycle looks like, we would start um, with the baby has a need, the baby cries, needs are met by the caregiver, and then trust develops. So we really need this reciprocal relationship in order to help the child progress through those de developmental milestones. And so, which brings us to kind of our main topic is when trauma happens, that may interrupt that healthy attachment. And so definition for trauma is individual trauma results from exposure to an incident or a series of events that emotionally, that are emotionally disturbing or life-threatening with lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Um, at this time, I'm going to pass it to Mel. Okay, can you guys hear me? All right, so complex trauma. So when we think about our kids, it's the exposure to multiple traumatic events, and it's also the impact of that exposure, okay? And these events are severe and pervasive, and they begin early in life. And because they begin early in life, they can disrupt many aspects of the child's development and early formation of self. And they often occur in the context of the caregiving relationship. Because that happens, it interferes with the child's capacity to formulate um, healthy attachment um, bonds. So if we look, Here's an unhealthy attachment cycle. So it's similar to what Nick was just describing. The baby has a need. It's gonna be expressed through the emotion or behavior. So in this case, the baby's crying. When the baby cries, the parent is either unresponsive, abusive, or neglectful. And so as a result, the child interprets the relationship as um, unsafe, chaotic, and the baby's need is not met at that time. So then the internal working model for that child now is that um, relationships are unsafe and um, their bodies now become poised for danger, meaning they're anticipating future harm. And that's happening in the context of relationship. So I want to show a video, hopefully it will work. Um, it kind of, it shows the healthy attachment relationship and then it shows the unhealthy attachment relationship. Um, I will say that this is kind of a difficult, um, it can be a difficult two minutes to watch. So have care of yourself as well. Um, but let me see. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still phase experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I knew my girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? Yeah. She makes that 
screechy sound at the mother. Like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction. They react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh, what a big girl. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So in thinking about that, I want you to hold that in your mind because that will give us context for when we delve into this case study. Um, think about healthy attachment is where they're really tuned into each other. That mother and baby, when they were um, in sync, they were looking at each other, they were following each other. Um, and so that's healthy attunement and healthy attachment. The bad is sometimes we miss, miss attunement, right? Mom might be looking this way, baby might be looking that way, but then there's repair, there's a coming back. And the ugly is when uh, there's none of that. There's, it's, they're just missing each other, okay? So um, I'll break down this. This is a client who, at the time of referral to my program, so the Family Place Day Treatment Program, uh, he was a four-year-old multiracial male child. He lived with his mother in a single-family home in North Minneapolis, and he attended a high five program five days a week um, for half days. The presenting problem was that the client was, um, he, ha he had clinical distress an impairment in his social, emotional, and regulatory function across settings. So when we say across settings, we're talking about in the community, in his daycare, in his home. Um, and he was exhibiting things like clingliness to his mom, uh, difficulty separating, sleep difficulties. Um, he wouldn't go to sleep. He had a fear of his upstairs. He had a fear of sleeping because he had frequent nightmares. Um, so that moves into fear. Other fear where he lived in a home where it was infested with rodents and insects. And so he didn't want to take a bath. So he wouldn't even go in the bathroom, which was located upstairs. Um, it showed in his noncompliance. He had frequent anger outbursts that would last for long periods of time, physical and verbal aggression. Um, speech and language delays, social emotional delays, um, attention and focus difficulties. He would switch frequently between activities um, and he couldn't just settle. Um, impulsivity. Another reason why they were seeking out services at the time was mom was needing some additional support and we were trying to reduce risk of any additional abuse or neglect. So I have this slide up there because as a clinician, I believe that behaviors are our way of communicating. And so when I see this type of presentation from a child, questions that I ask are what's underneath the behavior? What is he trying to tell me? And the other piece is what happened? What happened to him? And more importantly, what happened to mom? That, that this is how they're showing up in the world and this is how they're functioning. So if we look at it through the lens of adverse childhood experiences, and for those of you who are not familiar with that, these are events that um, are stressful or traumatic and they occur prior to the age of 18. And when, um, when a child experiences multiple adverse childhood experiences 
um, over time and without the buffering protection from a secure adult, it causes toxic stress. And toxic stress is essentially this activation of our stress response system. So all of us have experienced stress, right? And so when we get stressed, think about it as a light switch. So we get stressed, the light switch goes on, which is our stress response system. When the stressor ends, the light switch goes off and our body goes back to functioning as it normally did. For a child who's experiencing all these adverse childhood experiences, chronic stress, um, complex trauma, that light switch doesn't come off. So they're stuck in a stress response system that's constantly activated. So if we look at this client, these are all the things that he experienced before the, um, from zero to four. So when Maureen was talking about our kids are exposed to trauma prior to age four, he experienced all these things multiple times before four. Um, sometimes it's hard to talk about too. Um, when he, when mom was eight months pregnant with him, his father tried to murder her and him. So it even happened before he was born. So he was exposed to multiple physical abuse. There was domestic violence in the home. Um, as a result of that experience, dad was obviously arrested and incarcerated. But there were other family members in the home that were also arrested and incarcerated, um, which the client experienced. Um, substance misuse. So the maternal grandfather, he um, had some substance abuse issues. And he was also a caregiver for the child. And so when he kind of relapsed, he wasn't able to provide care for the child. Um, there was significant poverty. Mom was the provider for the family, but as you can imagine, um, the behaviors of the child impacted his ability to go to daycare, right? And so then she'd have to leave work or the people that she depended upon for support to watch him were unsafe. And so she was kind of put in this place of like, she couldn't win. Um, and so it perpetuated this system of poverty. Unsafe living conditions, I talked about um, the rodents and the infestation of the insects. Um, the house was just, the, the landlord didn't do a good job of helping her maintain it. And so it was really run down. And then we add to that community trauma. Um, looking at the violence, they lived in a, a neighborhood where there were frequent shootings. And I remember part of the fear that the client had about sleeping was he would come into our session and he'd say, Ma, uh, Mel, um, I couldn't sleep last night. I go, well, why? What happened, buddy? And he would say, well, the fireworks were going off. So that was mom's way of helping him like cope and not know that those were gun gunshots. So all of these things happened multiple times before the age of four. And so what, what's the impact? This little guy came in poised for danger. He didn't trust that you were going to, as an adult, take care of him because that wasn't his experience. Uh, he, he had a difficulty regulating his emotions and expressing them in appropriate ways. His behaviors, um, he could come into the room and start tipping over chairs, throwing items, um, and it, he could be, he could appear fine one minute and then explosive the next. He had distressing memories and dissociation. There was, there were times where we'd have to say, uh, come back to St. David's, you're at St. David's because his, he would stare off and it was as if he was reliving a distressing moment. Uh, and then he had a low self-esteem. So this is another way of looking at what's going on. So in the top, you have that context, multiple, chronic. That re represents his um, chronic trauma that's occurring. As a result, it moves down and it impacts the attachment. Okay, Because there's not that attachment and it's unhealthy, 
Now it's impacting him in the middle. That's your ability to self-regulate. He's not able to self-regulate. Then that moves over and it impacts his developmental functioning. Another way to look at it is if you look at these as um, different aspects of what the brain does, so the brain observes something, it takes in the input, it interp you interpret it, you process, you evaluate your options, you plan, and then you act. For a child like our client, it was, at, it was as if he was detouring. So he would get to observe something. So maybe you come in the room and he looks at your facial expression and he thinks you're mad. So he interprets that as now I'm, I'm in danger, okay? And then he, he takes a detour and he goes into fight, flight, or freeze. And then he acts, okay? So he didn't go through those other um, aspects of the brain because he's constantly detouring. So that became his pathway. So what does treatment look like? Um, as Nick mentioned, it's a multidisciplinary approach. So because we're working with a child whose um, development's been interrupted, we have to address it at all angles and aspects. Um, so I'm going to focus on the mental health day treatment piece of it, and then Nick will look at the kind of speech and occupation, occupational therapy. Uh, overarching goals, um, coordination of care and access to resources, strengthen the attachment relationship, and then support the child in returning to more typical developmentally, tra uh, more typical developmental trajectory. So that first one, think about it in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, in order to do treatment with this kids, this child, we had to really ensure that there was basic needs being met and safety. Um, otherwise, you can't get to that harder stuff. So how did that look in the classroom? Um, in the classroom, it's about providing predictability. It's about um, stability and safety. And you do that through um, the routine structure and um, showing up consistently as an adult. He was also a kid that, because of the food scarcity, he worried about having enough. So um, he might say to us, he might actually get really worried at the end of snack time um, because he didn't think he was gonna have enough food. And so we would say, at St. David's, there's enough food for you. So he would worry about having enough it would translate into um, his toys, sharing, those kinds of things. So we had to provide a lot of safety and containment around that and, and ensure that he knew that he had enough. With mom, it was providing those resources for her. She needed to have um, access to multiple things, and we did that through case management and also um, providing different um, programs. Excuse me. Um, so this is an important thing when we talk about relationships. Uh, this is a quote by Bruce Perry. He's a psychiatrist who works with um, children and trauma. And basically, he's talking about that change comes through the relationship. And as Nick talked about, that is our primary focus. Uh, regulation happens in a relationship, attachment, all this is important. So when we were working with the client, um, my focus was holding the client, establishing my relationship with him, holding the parent, establishing my relationship with her in the hopes of bringing those, um, kind of minimizing the gap between them, right? Bringing them together. And the relationship was key, but they had to practice relationship with someone who knew how to do relationship. Another part of it was developmental repair. And this is a model developed by Ann Garrity. And this is the foundation of what we do in our classroom. So there's four different quadrants 
um, there's relating, feeling, thinking, behaving. At the center is the self-regulation. Part of this model is to, we have to help the child repair self-regulation capacities. We're gonna do that through our relationship with the child. Um, the relating piece, so I'll just kind of go through those and then I'll give an example and then it will be next turn. Um, relating, so that has to do with joining the client where they're at. When you join the client where they're at, there's a sense of, um, think about that child who's being soothed. There's, um, if you can help them regulate, they will feel soothed. When they feel safe, they're able to access new knowledge and new learning. So that's the relating piece. The feeling piece is um, the narration. So where, or I'm sorry, that's the thinking piece. The thinking piece is, I'm gonna go down. Thinking piece is making sense of their experience, um, providing narration. I often say with, uh staff and clients that we need to speak into the silence we don't want to leave room for them to misinterpret how i'm feeling how i'm showing up what other people are doing in the room and so we're providing narration around everything so an example might be um if when the client was sitting next to me i would say you're needing something right now i'm going to get up and i'm going to walk and I was out loud about specifically what I was going to do because I didn't want him to worry about me coming back. So I'm going to walk, I'm going to get that thing over there, and then I'm going to come back. And as I'm doing that, I'm saying, oh, I still see you. Watch me. Yep, now I'm coming back. So that he wasn't surprised by anything that was happening and um, that he knew what I was going to do. The feeling part is... Our feelings help us orient us to our needs. They also help us make sense of other people's reactions to a shared experience. And we learn how to discover feelings in the context of a relationship, and we learn how to regulate feelings in the context of a relationship. And so by acknowledging those feelings, you're actually providing uh, safety as long as it's happening in the context of that relationship. And then behaving, like I said, this little guy was poised for battle. So he assumed that you were going to cause harm. And so if you came in demanding a change in his behavior, he would engage in a power struggle. Okay? And why? It's because his, his home was so chaotic and lacked a sense of control that in other settings, he was trying to grasp for control. So part of our job was coming alongside of him and helping him develop uh, better ways of behaving that weren't defensive. So I'm gonna give an example that will hopefully like encapsulate all of these things. Um, one day I had a, a staff member and she was, meeting with the client and the parent in the treatment room here. And she calls me on the walkie. And you can tell that it is going down in the room. Like it's loud noises. And you can tell from her voice that she's feeling super worried. So I come into the room and directly to my right is mom. So part of my job is I'm gonna look at my environment, I'm gonna look at how people are showing up in that environment, and I'm gonna assess what's going on. So mom's right right by the door. And um, she looks anxious, She uh, her voice is pressured, and she is loud, like almost yell, yelling. And you can tell she's agitated. So she's over here, and then I look ahead, and I see the client and around him, it, it looked as if he was throwing stuff and he had, it looked chaotic, it looked messy. And he's in the mess. So he's ahead of me and there's a trampoline by him and he would go on the trampoline and as he's doing it, he's yelling, he's screaming, he's agitated. He doesn't feel safe either. So I have a mom who doesn't feel safe. 
I have a client who doesn't feel safe and our environment is reflective of it right now. So in looking at this developmental repair model, I direct my staff member to go to the client first. I go to mom. Why? I'm going to mom because I need to get her feeling safe so that we can address the child. So I'm going to help her co-regulate in that moment so that we can come close to the child. So the relating piece is, hey, mom, I see you. Are you OK? I'm joining her in that moment. Then the thinking part is, I knew from previous conversations, she stood by the door when she felt unsafe because, because of all of her um, experiences with domestic violence. She wanted to be closest to the escape route. She's right by the door. So that's telling me she's not feeling safe right now. She also avoided windows. The windows were across the, kind of behind the client. And why did she avoid windows? In her neighborhood, there were stray bullets happening and her house got hit multiple times. So she didn't go by windows. So mom's feeling unsafe. So the thinking part of it was, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna speak into the silence, okay? Hey mom, I'm remembering, I remember you told me that when you don't feel safe, you stand by the door. I also remember that you don't like going by the window because of what happened at home. I'm here right now. I wonder if you can, if I can help you feel safe right now. So that's like me thinking about her experience. I'm addressing her emotions. And then I'm also kind of making the connection to how her emotions are impacting her behavior. And then in that moment, because I had a relationship with her and we were further along, we had established safety and all those Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we were further along in our relationship, she allowed me to join with her. And so we did some breathing and we did some calming activities. And then I said, okay, I'm noticing your son. When he feels worried, he starts yelling. When he starts yelling, you start yelling. Everybody was yelling and feeling unsafe. And I'm noticing that he wanted to try to get you to come closer, but he didn't know how to do that. Would you try something with me? And so she, she said, yes. And so I said, okay, we're gonna walk over and we're gonna practice connecting with him in a different way. And then part of this part pro, um, process was, I said to my staff and to the client, hey, we're coming close. You were trying to get mom's attention and you got really mad because mom wasn't able to come close, but now she's ready and we're gonna come close. So we come close and I say, mom, let's try something. It's kind of an experiment, but I'm wondering if you can do it with me. And now he's on the trampoline. So I say, mom, can you hold on to his hands? So mom holds on to his hands and he starts jumping. Not a big major thing that just happened, but what did happen was, think back to that video. Mom is now connected to child. Child's now connected to mom. They see each other. And in that moment, no words had to be exchanged. He felt safe, they felt connected. And so that's where the work began. It only was five to 10 seconds of that connection before they looked away. Um, but I said in that moment, this is how safe connection feels. And we can work together to make more connections. So it's the scooping of the child, the scooping of the mom, bringing them together, and um, reducing that space in between them. So that's how that, yes. So I have a question, yeah. if you don't mind uh, me interrupting a bit. I'm just trying to understand kind of how this plays out, and maybe there's not one path, suits all kind of thing, but a time between the, the parent or the caregiver and the child, for example, you know, how that kind of plays out. Do you have to trade off, or are you always working together? It depends on the family. Um, as sessions progress with this family, there was less need for multiple adults. But in this beginning, mom wasn't feeling safe, right? She wasn't able to do her own self-regulation. 
As a result, she couldn't help regulate the child. And so in this context, we had to lean into, we're gonna help regulate you, mom, so that someday you can help regulate the child. Um, and so in the beginning, it was all hands on deck. As it progressed, she was needing less and he was needing less. Does that make sense? Great question. Nick, do you, any other questions with that? Otherwise, Nick's gonna talk about speech and OT. All right, I'm going to skip ahead to this um, final one so that we have time for questions. Um, but this is just another uh, visual that kind of gets at what Mel was talking about. Um, so the growth happens within the context of relationship. Um, we have the parent and the child here. Um, and then when we think about uh, kind of child development as a tree, in the roots, we need to get the child regulated. What That's kind of what Mel was talking about. Um, and then we can start to work on these skills um, that are build, building blocks to being able to, to learn. And what I do as a speech therapist and our occupational therapist is a lot, it, it is with these learning skills. But what I learned with the client that we're discussing is that I had to go all the way back down to the roots. And I had to change my goals. I couldn't work on the S sound or building vocabulary until I had a relationship established with him. So I had to change my goals to the client will show um, shared enjoyment by smiling and laughing with the therapist on eight out of 10 opportunities, whatever it may be. Um, but really had to go back to the, the root of the foundation and then we could work on shared intention or shared attention, engagement, um, these building blocks, um, and then eventually get to the, the skills that we think about traditional speech therapy and occupational therapy. So I want to go ahead and leave some time for questions. If anybody has any. So many questions. Anyway, um, first of all, thank you for dedicating your life to this. But I, I find myself yearning for, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity for you to have gotten involved with this child earlier on instead of being thrown into so much repair mode. Uh, what are your thoughts, your strategies in that for? How do you get involved? With, obviously, you can't be coercive when you, probably you can see sometimes a train wreck coming. What are your thoughts about how do you get involved earlier on with the child? I'm take that I think it's complex. Um, so this child actually did have early childhood parent, um, what's it called, home visiting. So a home visitor was going into the home, but because of the complexity and all of the swirling that was happening, it wasn't enough. Um, I also think about the systems that people engage in and for a lot of our families, uh, they feel unsafe. And so it is, that's a barrier to even coming to get help. Um, so that's, it's hard to answer that um, because it is really much like with the mom, when we first started, she was like, okay, I'll meet with you. I only have 10 minutes, it's in my car. And she was ex expecting me to push back. And I said, okay, great. I look forward to going in the, like, put me on a phone call. I look forward to that. And I showed up. And every time, if it was 10 minutes, I showed up. And we built that relationship. And so then she could start trusting me. And she had a different experience with a system and a caregiver and a professional. And 10 minutes turned to 20. 20 minutes didn't turn to 30. By the end, I had a hard time ending the conversations because she'd be like, Mel, I still got to talk about this. And we're at 65 minutes, right? So it's, we do, this child did have early intervention and yet it wasn't enough. Other questions? I'll ask a question. Um, can you just share with us 
the impact on a lot of your clients um, with the killing of George Floyd, all the gun violence, the practices of gun safety in our schools? Can you just give us an, and, and then put COVID on top of it and, you know, just, just give us an idea of how it has impacted the program and, you know, that you work with, which is so important. Uh, yeah, that's a huge question. Um, and I think we all felt it um, as a community. Um, and I just, I think about uh, one specific client. Um, as we all were kind of going through those experiences and um, processing that, you know, we had to take a break from uh, in-person services but we slowly started to bring kids back. Um, and I just remember this one, one of the first clients that came back to see me in person. And some of our sessions, I just had to be present with them. Um, and because there's almost, there's almost nothing you can say. Um, but almost to just be present with someone when we're dealing with such an unimaginable um, things in our community. Just to be present with someone, say I'm here and it's gonna be okay, is very powerful. And I remember thinking, how are we gonna get back to where we were af you know, after all of these events had happened in our community? And Eventually, you know, more clients came back and we were able to have kids in the same room again. And at this specific client that was so down and I just, we couldn't even get anything accomplished in a session, but, but just to be present with each other, finally was able to be with friends again. And um, they were so excited to be in the same gym space and we started to see him just his affect lighten up and um, he started talking more and interacting and having a play plan. And I think that's all how we really felt is like we had to really cocoon and um, feel feel safe again and heal. Um, but I, I think it was such an amazing process to see that in our clients. More to add to that, Mel? I remember the the day that um, Lake Street was burning, and I came to work, and uh, we clients wanted to come back to day treatment. Parents were like, "Can you please?" And this is like, they wanted to come back, and so they had been in session since April. We had figured out a way to manage COVID enough to have clients come back, and I remember I'm sitting on the steps out there. The backdrop is smoke and one of my kids comes in and he, I might cry, um, he sits on the step and he starts weeping from a place that it's, it's not a surface. It, it's like, it, it came from a place of um, generational trauma, generational racism um and he was weeping from this place that was so so far down and i remember just sitting with him and holding him and rocking as the city's burning and i remember thinking wow our city's crying too it was such a profound moment of sadness that i didn't need to shift him out of it i needed to hold him in it the city was weeping and so were our kids and so were our families and they felt safe enough to like nick was saying just to sit with us and allow us the space and we held it for them we have time for maybe one more question does anyone have another question well i think you will do you have one more question, Joe? Thank you. This is so profound and powerful. 
tell us how you keep going. How do you replenish yourselves so that you can do what you do every day? <laughs> um, I have just been reminded in the last few weeks how powerful and the work that we do. And I, I truly believe just human connection and um, the power of community. I think that's what keeps me going is um, the realization of how connected we all we all truly are. We we're all very connected. And um, I think that is what keeps me going. Um, it's when kids knock on my door, Mel, Mel, I need gum, or like they're wanting a hug, or they want to show me their dab move, or um, we're just random dancing, or it's the joy that I experience from the kids that keeps me going. I also love, I love seeing my staff and like Nick and his team when they're working in their place of strength, it's incredible, like goosebumps, right? For the sake of these kids. And so that keeps me going, like the love for these children, the passion that um, my, my team and then the other professionals that I get to work alongside every day bring to it. Um, that's my motivation for continuing to do this work. It's a long road, it's a hard path, but there's growth that happens and there's beauty in that repair. We can't thank you enough for sharing your Sunday morning with us. Um, and I, the last question that was asked is one that we should all um, be so, glad that you responded in the way you do because you do so much important work right on the second floor of this building and um, I just know that good things happen when good people do wonderful work. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind you that next Sunday um, Jason Spaeth who is a former trustee, I'm not sure he's a current for trustee, but he's a, a former trustee at a minimum. And he's on the Westminster Investment Committee, and he will be here to discuss socially and environmentally responsible investing. And we look forward to hearing him. So thank you for joining us this morning, and thank you three for doing this wonderful work that you're doing for these children. <laughs>